we'll get started. Jenny, thank you uh, for putting it together. And thank all of you uh, for coming. The main role here today is to, to listen to the stakeholders that have an observation. And I appreciate this opportunity. As you know, uh, President Obama signaled that uh, Congress will be discussing uh, health care probably after the July 4th recess. And there are a lot of moving parts, a lot of the proposals you've seen. Uh, like we talk of the national voluntary national health care policy, or we talk of uh, eliminating the tax deduction for employment based health care. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that, that this can go. Uh, and uh, there was a meeting at the White House with President Obama about a month ago with uh, the health care industry, and the promises we're going to get right now trillions of dollars at uh, cost. And we'll have to see where, where that goes. But uh, as I will be uh, the opportunity to be a participant in that, uh, I thought it would be a good idea, and Jenny suggested we, we get together. Uh, to sit and uh, receive input from you. Uh, just a couple of introductions in the, uh, the very back of the room. Uh, Nick C. Uh, is in the Twinsburg office, and Sarah Cannon, uh, who handles uh, health care issues for us on Capitol Hill, and she's been kind enough to come to the motion for us. So we're rewarding a cardiologist to do a heart catheterization. We're rewarding a thoracic surgeon to fix the plumbing after the disease is already out there after the chronic disease has already uh, ravaged the arteries and we're um, like the Cheney's arteries trying to do bypass grass around the blockages. Um, that's way, way, way more expensive and way, way, way too late to actually have meaningful impact. What we're not rewarding is a, a primary care physician to do um, the lion's share of the work that's required that isn't currently really compensated. Spending five minutes with a patient talking about smoking cessation, which most physicians should be doing, isn't where a physician is going to have his billable hours, if you will, um, in the current system. Even though preventive care may be um, uh, compensated 100%, if you actually identify that they have the early onset of the disease, that's not necessarily covered at 100%. Let me say this about costing money, not costing money. One of the problems we have uh, is with the way that the federal budget is scored and this dynamic scoring that they have. And just by way of example, the last few Congresses with Marcy Kaplan have introduced legislation that would show everybody without insurance in the country. It has a price tag of $35 billion a year. Now, the stuff that I've seen says it will save $48 billion a year because of the things that we are talking about. But it scores it. Outlay of 35 million, and, and until we until we change that sort of uh, dynamic, I mean, where, where I come from, we were saving 13 billion dollars, but to so OMB and CBO, no, we're not, and so that's a big. Even if we, you know, need to take a stepping stone way to get to the medical home model, there needs to be an incentive to integrate behavioral health and physical health care. Because right now, in the state of Ohio, individuals with severe mental illness die 32 years younger than their counterparts without severe mental illness. And the majority of those deaths are a result of preventative, treatable, chronic illnesses such as heart disease and diabetes. And it's a function that they are scared of, or they don't know how to, or they don't want to see someone other than their caseworker that's at their mental health clinic. And so, to create a system in which they can go to one building and see the same nurse to have both their sugar levels taken and also to get their case management would be ideal for the patients that we see and the patients that my members see because these individuals do want to see a primary care physician to deal with the other physical health needs that they have, but they also have social interaction issues, and once they become connected to a provider, they, they have difficulties connecting to other providers. But 36% of Ohioans cannot read the labels and the material we stuff in the bags, right? And I had a group of nine people I spoke to the other day that said the dumbest question in pharmacy is, do you have any questions for the pharmacist? Why aren't your people coming out uh, and talking to our folks? And yet, economic issues are one part of it, but luckily, we are being recognized for the simple things. And I guess that's my, my plea in this, is that as I've worked in Ohio as a representative of pharmacy for 20 years, generally, 
With all managed care and with most insurers, providers are regarded as adversaries. We have not been at the table. And I'll tell you my concern with electronic medical records is real providers are not at the table and those systems are not working. We are getting more wrong prescriptions through electronic prescriptions right now than I've ever seen. And yet there's no one to report it to, okay? And it's really spooking me because we had one the other day with a pharmacy board member where the prescription came through as cortisporin otic and airdrop one capsule three times a day. And the pharmacist thought, well, they just clicked on the wrong thing. She called the physician and he said, you know, oddly, it's still on my computer screen and it shows a box of selling 500 capsules. The electronics were wrong. Bottom line is, uh, we're happy to work with you and we think that as providers, I support the medical home uh, with the governor's task force under medical home. We put medication therapy management. The pharmacist should be paid for that and it's part of the team. But uh, we appreciate you coming in and, and meeting with all these folks because chronic disease is where it's at both in terms of 80% uh, of the cost, even though they're only 20% of the patients. And I think if we can concentrate on that part, it's going to help all these folks, plus make sure that we're using our services. All the things we've been discussing here are all things that are certainly, we need more primary care physicians, we need more pediatric specialists. All these things cost money. I think if we um, looked at wellness and prevention as a way to save money, it might be more of an incentive to move that agenda along. Of course, the Cleveland Clinic has been on the forefront of this. We have a chief wellness officer. We don't hire smokers. Um, there's many different things we've implemented. But I, I think what we have to do is find a way to incentivize patients to take personal responsibility for wellness. And if we can incentivize them through <coughs> lower co-pays for Medicare, uh, lower co-pays for other visits, and we can incentivize them by giving them these lower co-pays if they met a marker, whether it would be um, a certain weight, a certain blood pressure, a certain body mass index, we would then find that we have a cost savings as a result of health and wellness. It might help pay for some of these things we've been talking about here today. And when we took um, bad stuff out of the vending machines, people looked at that as punitive. They, were, they looked at it as like Big Brother. When we stopped hiring smokers, I thought it was a great idea, but it was it really impacted my ability to recruit nurses because a lot of the kids coming out of college are smoking. So it's a good practice, but you also have to back into it some culture change, and we didn't do that. Two, two, two quick things that I want to touch upon before I, I go and answer these kids' questions. Mm -hmm. uh, but one is, uh, I, I, all of these, suggest, most of the suggestions are focused on the need for prevention and education and, and management and making sure people understand what they're doing and they live well and have uh, the back of the monkey bars in, in school and things like that. Uh, I, I know that there's universal consensus. And the, the, the one issue I mentioned in the other is that the Republican, the Republicans say that we just got the lawyers and had uh, medical malpractice uh, adjustments, this whole thing would go away. I don't have to be a believer in that. Uh, but I, I, I am a believer in that when you have a problem, there has to be global buy-in. You just can't have the doctors and the hospitals and the pharmacists and the nurses uh, and the educators. The lawyers are a part of it. And the question is, one side says it's a big part of it, one side says it's not part of it at all. And the other thing that's going to be discussed is, is, is how are we going to pay for it? Say we, say we spend five trillion dollars a year uh, today on health care in the United States. 169 million Americans currently get their health care from your uh, And uh, sh do we solve the problem by, and, and, and I, I don't want anybody to, to be confused, but I'm not, I don't have faith that this voluntary national policy that they're talking about is going to be voluntary for very long. So what we are talking about is is a transfer from the employer-based health care system to a single payer national. I, I really think that's the debate because what when you when you develop the, the national policy and it has a reduced cost because it's subsidized by the government and you then take away the tax deductibility from the employer to provide health care, I, I don't you'd be an idiot to be an employer and continue to provide health care for your employees if you can't affect the cost of it. So if, if that's going to be the discussion. And I, I would appreciate, I, I think, if not now, um, thoughts about uh, 
what what this thing should look like. How should we spend the five trillion dollars uh, that is, is currently spent, whatever that number is in the United States, to make sure that that uh, people in this country have health care that, that follows experience uh, and, and that is fair. 